So here's the definition of what the Food Security Information Network was asked to provide information about. This definition is something that many of us can probably uh, recite by heart. It's something that's in the introduction to thousands and thousands of different uh, papers and reports. Agreed to in the mid-90s, so we're gonna spend a bit of time about, about dates, and interestingly amended in 2009, about 10 years later at the um, follow-on World, uh, World, World Summit. And this is the, the 2009 summit is the, is the occasion at which the four pillars idea was uh, first articulated. And we'll come back to this uh, in a minute. But the thing I want to highlight is that even back in 1996, in the original first definition that was agreed to by the international community for the United Nations system agencies and the funding arms that would define the program and policy agenda from the mid-1990s of what donors wanted to support around the world, what UN governments wanted to endorse around the world, and what NGOs would ultimately pursue around the world, these nutritional dimensions of food security were already central to the agenda. It is just not true that nutrition was absent from the agenda, at least starting in the 1990s. My farm surveys I was talking about were 1988, uh, 89, 90, um, you know, well before this. So we're gonna come back to the distinction between food, food security, and nutrition indicators. And when we trace back the diversity of measurement that happened in the wake of those food security definitions of 96 and 2009, there was this proliferation of up to 150 different indicators that we described, and then there were many efforts to categorize. So here's a list of recent efforts to categorize them. And every single one of these efforts attempts to say, we will be the one-stop shop, the one authentic go-to compendium that will end all compendiums and, uh, and, and provide guidance. But as our own learning lab experience shows, that's not realistic. You do the FSIN user's guide, which we'll talk about, and then index comes along and says, well, we have a better way of doing it. And it is indeed better. That's the point, is we're learning from each other how to classify and define and measure better. So we see this as a rolling circus, a rolling caravan of improvement, where we're um, today going to focus just on the two projects and their outputs that we, that we have, but that there will be improvements over time. So this Food Security Information Network uh, user's guide was published at the time of the ANH Academy last year, in, 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 in uh, June 2016. And it was composed of a project led by Uma Lele, a very prominent agricultural economist, did most of her career at the World Bank, uh, myself an economist working from agriculture to nutrition, uh, Joyce Canabo, a prominent Tanzanian uh, nutritionist who is here uh, in a, another session uh, at this time, uh, Mina Minakshi, a uh, prominent economist working on uh, micronutrients, economics, of biofortification, and so forth uh, at the Delhi School of Economics, Bharat Ramaswamy, uh, Indian um, economist focused on food security and poverty reduction, Julia Taguere uh, is a Zimbabwean uh, nutritionist, uh, did most of her career in the, in the World Bank, uh, and Winnie Bell and Sambuda Goswami. Uh, assisted with the, with the project. So what we had as our motivation was the problem of the zoo, right, that there were just so many animals in this uh, menagerie of different kinds of measurement that people were crazily confused as to what to uh, measure, what, you know, what to use for their project uh, for monitoring and evaluation, what to use as their policy indicator, what to use as their advocacy tool. Uh, and there were so many different just ways of talking about it. We'll see what those were. That led to tremendous conflict. Okay, so confusion is a polite word for people saying, that's terrible. <laughs> right, so the, conf the kinds of conflicts that led to this project were between institutions, so UNICEF approach to measurement, WFP approach to measurement, FAO approach to measurement, and they were unable to get donors to agree on pooling their funds, and that was not okay. 
So the confusion is you know, a polite term for conflict. The conflict was actually quite serious about whether you would or would not agree to have a given indicator in your uh, project's proposal. Furthermore, what we saw was tremendous redundancy where indicators were overlapping with each other using different n names for the same thing uh, in ways that were really not helpful. Um, and furthermore, that the terminology, and we're about to see this uh, very dramatically, the terminology in the descriptions carried historical baggage where people of a certain age had a certain thing in mind when they used a term, and other people who are younger are like, what are you talking about? Why does that matter so much? We care about X. And there came to be schools of thought about what was food security and what was nutrition that were generational in nature, where people had historical definitions that were getting in the way. So the question was, could we give some logic to kind of clean up the debate? Umalele is a tremendously energetic uh, person of a certain age, as they say, who remembers everything about the history of these debates and was able to bring forward. And then we had much younger people, you know, part of this process bringing. So the, trying to understand this historical accumulation was very, very important. Uh, and the institutional frameworks whereby UNICEF or WFP or FAO had different perspectives. So every one of you in your careers, I'm sure, has encountered this when you go from one donor to another donor, one implementing partner to another implementing partner, and our task today is just to bring some logic to this problem. So hopefully, it's, we, we acted on this opportunity. Right? I hope that we were able to help clean up this confusion and make it possible to think about measurement without, in a more logical way. So here's the um, basic uh, sort of uh, situation we, we address, right? So FSIN is charged, remember, by the Rome-based agencies with European Union money to serve the stakeholders in national governments. And we found that those national government stakeholders had very diverse goals. The first um, charge to the FSIN task force was, can't you give us a single dashboard? Can't you give us a dashboard that will look like the front of a car? You know, speed could be, for example, height. HAZ, stunting rates. That would be like the speedometer of a car. And then you might have something that's a little more specialized, like the temperature of the car. And that could be anemia. And then you might have another indicator on your dashboard, which could be the um, oil light that goes on when the oil level is low. And that could be, and so you'd have like maybe six or eight things on a dashboard. Okay? That was, seemed like a really good idea until we talked to more people. And they're like, no, no, you don't, that's not enough. It needs to be like the dashboard of a, of a jet airplane. When you go into an airplane, I mean, if you've ever been in the front of an airplane, you're like, this is incredible. There's an indicator of this, indicator for that. You've got the, this, this, and people are like, you know, and then we're like, that's not possible. You can't make a dashboard, a single dashboard. So many people said, no, no, that's not right. What we want is different dashboards. Like you'd have the dashboard for a car, and then you have the dashboard for your microwave oven, right, which has just, you know, different things on it. And then you have your dashboard for something else, which has so that. And then we said, wait a minute, there's actually so many different multiple dashboards that we want to do something completely different. So what we did was to say, we're not going to do that at all. Instead, what we want is what we call a user's guide. So what you have on your table is the user's guide. That's the idea is a single document that will describe and assess the most widely used. Okay? So this is like a user's manual for how to create your own dashboard. Okay? Each project will have a different kind of dashboard, and we're not specifying what that should be. We're, we're providing you a whole menu of things that you can put in the front of your vehicle to drive it to where you want to go. That allows you to say, I want three indicators, or five, or however many you want to take from the user's guide. It allows you to discover new indicators that you didn't even know existed. It's a much better idea, in our opinion, than pre-specifying a dashboard. Okay, so I hope you can see that distinction. 
But in making the user's guide, we didn't want to have a user's guide to everything. We wanted a certain limitation. Otherwise, it would be 1,000 pages long. And if tomorrow comes, it would be 1,002 pages long. It would have to keep growing. That's not reasonable. So we set a limit, and we set that limit through our objectives, our purpose. What, what is this user's guide supposed to guide people towards? So here are our overarching principles. Here's why you want to choose one indicator as opposed to another. And ultimately, in this user's guide, we ended up with enough indicators to fit within uh, a roughly 100-page document. That was our approximate target, was something to be about 100 pages long. So the first principle is this. This is like the first commandment of nutrition, right? The first commandment of nutrition is dietary energy that will get you through the day that we measure in calories is very important, but you need to measure more than that because getting through the day doesn't confer lifelong or intergenerational health, right? I could have adequate energy for the day, but depletion and inadequacy and therefore disease burden and mortality, so we must measure more than calories. But in doing that, there are many dimensions of diet quality. I need a certain set of micronutrients for immune function, I need another set of micronutrients for muscle mass, I need another set of immune, and so forth, and so on. So we can't simply say, and furthermore, there's lots of things that aren't food at all that are in nutrition, disease, and so forth. So we need to make sure we've got the full set of dimensions covered that are more than calorie. Second point is look over the whole life cycle. Because what people need in adulthood is not what you need uh, in old age or childhood or infancy. And in particular, as you know, the thousand day period of utero, in utero development of gestation and infancy to age two, that thousand day period has been the exclusive, almost exclusive focus of USAID, for example, over the previous um, uh, six or seven years. Um, and we want to see that in the context of the whole life cycle. So pre-pregnancy through uh, uh, parenting all the way into uh, old age. And the different groups will have different interests. So we'll look beyond the thousand days. The third commandment is look beyond agriculture and nutrition in terms of intake to what's between farms and consumers. The whole food system, all the transformation, transport, processing, marketing, and all of that, so we would have indicators that would capture the whole food system. Think about it over time in terms of resilience and vulnerability, uh, and think about it in the long term in terms of sustainability. So you can see that these principles are asking for a big agenda of measurement, and that agenda has to have a purpose. There is no reason to include a measure in the indicator's uh, gu user's guide if it doesn't matter for someone. So we want the user's guide to orient people towards the best way to measure to mobilize action, where action is broadly defined to include the kinds of things that stakeholders in the nutrition world want to see improved. And in particular, when we provide a useful measurement tool or indicator, a formula, a, a thing like stunting rates, that allows people to say, wait, we want to measure the heights of more children, right? We want more children to be measured because once you have a way of using the numbers, you want to collect the data. So this is action partly to orient and mobilize resources for data collection and partly to mobilize response to the data that is collected. Today, we're not going to talk about any numbers. We're just talking about logic. But the goal is clearly each of these um, four principles. So let me pause there and ask what you think of these criteria. So I haven't yet told you anything about where we ended up, right? Of course, you have it on your desk, so you can see on your table. You can see what the user's guide is. But do you think that these principles are about right as guiding choice of what to measure? in terms of, say, a food insecurity score, a coping strat strategies index, a diet diversity score, a um, uh, 
head circumference or any kind of measurement that you want to do, are these the right principles? Can you think of other principles we should have used? It, it took us quite a while to get to these four. <laughs> um, I can tell you this fourth one was uh, a latecomer. <laughs> so we were debating these three for a long time before um, Julia Tagore in the group said, look, if you don't choose indicators that are simple enough, you won't have impact. So simplicity and clarity and relevance is really the criterion here. These other ones are, um, are uh, more scientific, I would say, in nature. Okay. So remember, here's the definition that we're working from. Here's the thing we're trying to measure. Recognizing that this thing has many dimensions, right? It's like a car or an airplane or microwave oven. It's doing a lot of different things. So we want a lot of different ways to know, is this airplane about to crash or is it doing well? Right, so, so there's a lot of things you need to measure um, and we want to measure all these things. And the FSIN user's guide is the broad thing and then the index project is a deep dive. Okay, so we're going to do the broad thing first and then the deep dive and we'll come back to different categories. So what's important about the history of the indicators, remember the 150 or so different indicators in current use in different organizations, each of them has a vintage. Each of them was formed at a certain time with a certain institution for a specific purpose and many of them traced their roots back to the World Food Conference of 1974, the 1973-74 food crisis. At this time, the, the food crisis of 1973-74, I was uh, 12 years old. I was beginning to sort of read the media and, uh, and you know, read newspapers and magazines and, um, and, and, and television news and get a sense of what was This was very, very important to me. This is an event that you know, sort of influenced the course of my life quite dramatically, kind of seeing what was happening in Bangladesh and around the world and you know, being very sort of conscious of, of this um, from, my, from my childhood. So the definition of food security that was adopted at the World Food Conference of 1974 in response to the food crisis of 1973-74 um, is this. This is the definition that they adopted, they wrote down that time. Availability at all times of adequate world food supplies of basic foodstuffs to sustain a steady expansion of food consumption and to offset fluctuation in production and prices. That was their whole definition. This is not our definition today, right? So why was that their definition then? I don't think all that many of you are as old as I am that this was a childhood experience of yours. And it was a time when food price spikes were most visible and dramatic in world markets. People didn't have price measurements in rural areas. All that there was was the price of rice when traded internationally, which is Bangkok 5% broken rice, right? Exported from Southeast Asia, the typical port being the port of Bangkok. And what is the price of, bank, uh, of, of X Bangkok 5% broken rice? What is the price of number two yellow corn coming out of Shreveport, Louisiana, of the Mexico, Gulf of Mexico, coast of the United States? What is the price of wheat coming out of Argentina? So those were the world food prices that everyone cared about here. That was it. That was the whole ball game. That's what they cared about was the price of basically three staple grains. And the reason why they cared about that, the world price of those grains, is because they were panicked. They were panicked that there would be, and I was panicked as a 12-year-old reading the news and being really worried that I was living in a world where there was going to be massive, massive starvation. And in response to the world food crisis of 1973-74, a bunch of things happened in response to this world food conference and so forth. So what happened after the world food crisis of 1973-74? What are some of the things that occurred after that in response to panic that these three major commodities, rice, maize, and wheat, would be so scarce that South Asia would be in mass starvation. In the United States, there were many books published that predicted that India, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, and Nepal would be in uh, states of massive starvation such that it would be necessary to decide who would live. 
There was a, 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 a book called Lifeboat Earth, in which, and the idea was that the governments would somehow have to decide who would survive in these countries. So what happened in, 19, in the 1970s subsequent to this? That brought about the advent of uh, the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution happened, right? There was the founding of uh, ICRASAT uh, um, and uh, IRI in the Philippines for rice, ICRASAT um, for, for uh, small grains and so forth that meant very rapid productivity growth and rice, wheat, and maize declined in price all through they stayed high through the 70s to 1978, 79, but then through the 80s and 90s, the prices of those commodities just declined. They declined because of successful productivity growth in response to this exact declaration. There was also a number of measures to help stabilize the price as well as reduce it. So after this, there was a sharp decline in stabilization of prices. This solved the problem it intended to solve. The problem was huge and the problem went away because of action being taken. In the 1980s, at this time of declining prices, the, as the Green Revolution was taking hold, there wasn't another World Food Summit because there wasn't another world food crisis, so no need for that sort of thing, but there was um, this declaration from 1983 from the FAO that responded to the concerns of 1983. And they responded to the concerns with this definition. Ensuring that all people, not just the world average, but everyone in a country, at all times, not just certain um, uh, years, but within years, have both physical and economic access. There, it's not that there's just food in a shop, but that you have enough money to get it from the shop to basic foodstuffs that they need. Okay? So the basic foodstuff part of it is still in panic mode about total food calories from the 1970s. This is just 1983, right? Still very close to the 70s. So they're still just thinking about basic foods. But in thinking about basic foods, what are they thinking about? What are some other terms we would use for an, an, an emphasis on all people? They're thinking about distribution. They're thinking about equity. They're thinking about empowerment and entitlements and whether people are included in government. That's because what was happening at this era was structural adjustment, meaning that developing countries had borrowed so much money in the 1970s they couldn't pay it back and they were required by their lenders to devalue their currency, reduce staff levels in the civil service, and that limited the ability of governments to help poor people in their, in their countries. And so the structural adjustment era was an era of focus on equity, inequality, similar to what we have today to some degree, but the politics, of course, were very different, a, a, a focus on equity, 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 equity. So this is about access, meaning equity. This is about availability, meaning world food prices, right? So availability meant world food price, access meant Equity. That's historical. People of these ages have this in mind. But when you read it today with fresh eyes, those words don't mean what, they, what people think they mean. Right? Here's our modern era definition. From 1996, remember the World Food Summit that brought us the current, current definition. Um, food security exists when there's not just basic foodstuffs, but safe and nutritious food to meet food preferences, if you like uh, chapati and dal, you should be able to have wheat. And if you like rice and dal, you should be able to have rice. You, you know, and all these uh, specific preferences should be respected, um, and it should be for an active and healthy life, not just subsistence. So this is the era in which medical discovery and public health is blossoming. And for the first time, we have a lot of the foundational science of the indicators that we're going to talk about together today. So this is the evolution, and it led to the following models that people have in mind. Okay, so when we started the FSIN project to make the user's guide, and people wanted a dashboard 
this is what the FAO representatives wanted us to do. Remember, this is EU funding coming to the FAO World Food Program and, and, and IFPRI saying, could you please give us a proper dashboard? And FAO said, this is our dashboard, this one. So what is this? This is availability, access, utilization, underpinned by stability. When people ask, what do you mean by availability? They use these terms. But anybody who has read their history knows availability means world food prices, right? Availability means, does it exist somewhere? Access means equity, because the term came in in 1983 at the structural adjustment period when people were being excluded. Utilization means the 1990s agenda of public health and preferences and equity in terms of cultural uh, desire for, 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 for you know, how people use food. Um, and then stability underpins it all to have uh, security over time. So this is the FAO's definition, the four pillars that embody history, availability, access, utilization, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, in a way that is perhaps in some ways profoundly confusing. Um, and it's profoundly confusing in part because I've never met a farmer who didn't grow something because someone wanted to use it. There is no supply without demand. There's no availability without utilization. They're, these are not different things, actually. They're just not. They're not different things. It's a distinction without a difference, <laughs> except for the historical uh, rationale, which I, which I described. So this FAO framework is a profoundly useful one for diplomatic uh, and, and FAO-type purposes. There's a reason why it has survived. This is another framework that stakeholders in the FSIN said, wait a minute, what about the UNICEF framework? What's the UNICEF framework? In 1990, UNICEF, concerned with child nutrition uh, as the sort of highest goal of what they wanted, said, how about we classify all our measurement in these terms? We'd like to classify measures as things which are the manifestation, the outcome, which is malnutrition itself, that's at the top of the picture because it's their highest goal. And that would be child heights, uh, child, uh, um, child weight, and, and so on and so forth. Then there would be some immediate causes of those outcomes, which would be things like inadequate dietary intake or disease. Then there are underlying causes, and then there are basic causes. And this way of categorizing indicators says let's measure this as the underlying foundational thing and then we'll measure this as the result of that. The idea reflects their priorities as a, a global advocate for uh, child health. But then there were other stakeholders who said no, no, this is how we want to classify indicators. We want indicators that go from left to right so that my program can intervene in production in a way that will then lead to interventions, perhaps in transformation, which would then lead to intake and health outcomes. So going from left to right is a way that people who write English or Romance, European languages, when we write from, we write from left to right, when we write, so it allows us to think logically in terms of first, second, third, causality in time, planting, harvesting, feeding, and, and child development. It's also good for projects. Today you do this, tomorrow you do this, the next day you do that. It's a common causal pathway way of thinking that's quite useful for people in projects. Okay? So what we've just seen are three totally different ways of categorizing indicators that correspond to an institutional goal right? FAO, UNICEF, and this is the UN Sustainable Development Goals, 
uh, causal pathway for governments to intervene in one place and have an effect later on. Okay. The problem from a measurement point of view is that each institution says we should use this, we should use that, we should do that, and we want to be a, an impartial advocate who will serve all the stakeholders, all of you, all different organizations, in a way that would make sense, particularly because everything is connected to everything else. This is called a systems dynamic model in which each thing you might measure, so child heights, dietary intake, whatever you want to measure, this is a system dynamics model for a US program that aimed at um, uh, healthy food systems on the far left. And you see how everything is, this is natural. We understand that in reality, everything is connected uh, to everything else. And so we'd like to transcend each particular organization because when you, if you're working in programs, want to classify indicators, you're going to want to do something like this. This is a log frame that a program manager would want to use. If you've ever been working in a project funded by a typical donor, they would say, can you do us something like this? Which says, what are your strategic objectives? This happens to be the um, logical framework for CADAP, the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program, which is a multi-donor effort to fund the European Union's uh, CADAP um, mobilization of national government uh, efforts for agriculture uh, and including nutrition. And so they would specify specific objectives. And so people said, can you give us indicators in terms of a particular log frame? We said, this is just way too much different ways of structuring the world, right? Each map is just a, too, too different from each other and people can't agree ultimately. We tried pretty hard to get to some kind of visualization like these that uh, FSI and stakeholders could agree to. Instead what we did is we turned to a literature uh, in social determinants of health called a social ecological model. In the social ecological model, we think about scale. We think about scale of analysis to say everything causes everything else. Every, different organizations have different priorities, but when we measure, when we do indicators of food security and malnutrition, the most useful thing is going to be to make a user's guide that's based on what you measure. Just what it is that you wrote down, captured, and kept as your datum, as your, as your indicator. So the first observation is that some things exist at the country level. That's what they are. It's an observation of a country. So the most fundamental thing that exists at the country level is a food balance sheet. So how many of you have used, seen, have a sense of what a food balance sheet might be? So just very few of you. I'll go a little bit, so bear with me. Those of you who do have a sense of it, bear with me. I'll go a little bit slowly. Food balance sheets come from a country's national accounts. They represent the total that occurred within a country's borders of everything produced. So all of the lentils produced in Nepal. And that estimate comes almost always from the Ministry of Agriculture based on reports from district level agricultural officers who say we think there was this many hectares of, of, of lentils and this much yield and this is the total production. From that you add the quantity imported. That comes from the customs office who report there was so many shipments of lentils that were reported to come in. You subtract the quantity exported coming from the customs office that reported how many shipments of lentils went out. You subtract all the non-food uses of lentils, any stock change, if somebody reported that they accumulated stocks, um, and, any estimate, and an estimate of waste. That gives you total food supply available for consumption. You divide that by the number of people and you get per capita total quantity. Now a lot of people call that availability. 
It's also utilization. It's utilization because nobody grew any lentils or imported it if somebody wasn't going to eat it. You wouldn't produce if it's not going to be consumed. You wouldn't supply if it's not going to be demanded. And so this is consumption. This is intake, right? This is intake. It's average per capita intake of lentils or whatever the thing might be. The problem is it exists only at the national level because it comes from imports and exports. You have no idea where it went. Did it all go to Kathmandu? Did it go to the countryside? You have no idea, right? It's average per capita total by definition. It's a country level observation. It's not according to a pillar. It's not according to a causal pathway. It's not according to a log frame. It simply is an observation which could be used in any one of those things. Okay, so that's the first kind of data. A second kind of data are things that are observed at a locality, a place within Nepal, like a marketplace, an actual physical marketplace, or a community, like a, a you know, VDC in the countryside. So a thing that exists only at the community or marketplace level is most fundamentally a price. A price is a thing that exists at a place in time. If I go to this market on this day, and I want to buy lentils, if it's this market, it will be one price. If it's that market, there'll be another price. There is no such thing as the Nepal price. There is only the price in a given market on a given day. It is fundamentally a community level fact, a thing which exists at the level of a community. There is no such thing as a national price, and, there, and household prices are not different from the community level price. Okay? So, um, when we observe that price, it's the price sold and the price purchased. By definition, a price is both the price at which you sell and the price at which you buy. So it's not a matter of access, availability, whatever. It just is a community level thing. That's what it is. Now, the interesting thing about a, a community level price sorry, is that we don't know which person gets it. So we need to zoom in to the next level of analysis, which is households. Households are entities in nutrition and in agriculture, we often define it as shared cooking. There are actually other definitions of households that are sometimes useful, but shared cooking is relevant for nutrition because many, many, many aspects of diets um, occur only through a shared, they can be measured, excuse me, only through the shared cooking activity. We, don't, we can't know which person took out which piece of the common dish. Right? You just can't tell whether this was given to this person or that person. But you can define the common uh, pot of the family. They often, but not always, farm together as well. So commonly, people, there's a pooled farm and then a pooled uh, diet that a household has. A household has a diet. Right? That we just don't know exactly which individual within it. When we observe a household uh, information, we're observing something that's shared. Um, it's also the natural unit of account for many food transactions. So production, intake, and uh, food systems or transactions um, are often occur at the household level. Uh, and we couldn't do a food balance sheet for the household, right? where we'd have food households. So this is a kind of data that Index Project will talk a lot about. And finally, individuals. So individuals are things, people, us, who have, for example, heights, weights, uh, hemoglobin, vitamin A levels, and so on and so forth. Right? Those, so I want to just pause for a second and say this is different. This is not the usual way of classifying measures. The purpose of this learning lab is this. Like, I'm almost, I'm done, basically, right? This is, this is the transformation. We're not classifying measures in terms of the familiar, these things. We're not. Why? Because food balance sheets are all of these things at the national level. Household uh, total consumption is 
all of these things at the household level. Right? So we're, re we're rethinking how to describe measures in terms of the thing which is measured. Either a country fact, like Nepal has this total quantity of lentils within its borders. A household fact, a market fact, which would be the price of lentils at this market. A household fact, which is how much lentils are in the common pot. And an individual fact, which might be how much lentils did this particular boy eat, or what is that boy's height, and so forth. So our measurement task is squarely to establish facts, recognizing that we want to choose facts according to the four principles. Go beyond calories, go over the life course, through the whole food system, at data about these things that will mobilize action. Right? So that's our task. So when we uh, did that with the FSIN um, over all issues, the index project followed on immediately. And when he began to work for the index project, to do a deep dive into the dietary assessment that she's about to. So I am going to talk a little bit about the index project and then talk about how we've developed this um, beta version right now of a guiding framework for dietary related food security indicators and how that fits into this, these other frameworks that Will has just nicely described. So just a short um, background on the index project, which stands for the International Dietary Data Expansion Project. It's a five-year um, project that's been funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and, and we are collaborating with the Food and Agriculture Organization and with IFPRI. The main objective of the project is to increase the availability, access, and use of um, all types of dietary data, so both at the individual and the household level. Um, and we're doing that through trying to alleviate some of the bottlenecks associated with collection of individual level dietary data through methods like 24-hour recalls, but also trying to um, harmonize tools like household consumption expenditure surveys for nutrition and food security purposes. So as one of the first outputs of the project, we developed this online framework. I know Will said that there's no such thing as one-stop shop, but we're trying to create a one-stop shop for food security, for dietary related food security indicators. So again, our specific focus is on individuals and households that are consuming foods and how we can better measure um, nutrient intake and uh, food at, at those levels. So just to orient you a little bit, this tool is publicly available and you can access it at this link. Um, when you get there, you'll see this um, cover page, which is currently under revision, but it's still accessible as you see it here. And the basic idea is that each of these little boxes will take you into a different portal. And so the first one takes you into um, more detailed information about specific indicators. The second one takes you to a description about data sources, um, this one here. And then down below, these boxes will take you to um, sort of policy relevant uh, case studies that are linked to indicators. And so the idea of the guiding framework is, as I said, to offer this one-stop shop online that um, hopefully synthesizes both indicators, methods, um, data sources, and any guidelines and validation studies that exist, so that rather than you having to hunt around online to figure out which dietary diversity score to use for which purpose, you can come here and hopefully the guidance that we provide can help you identify for the type of study that you're doing um, what tool might be most useful for you. So. We've just, the reason it's the beta version is that it's just been reviewed by our technical advisory group. And so we're um, currently integrating the feedback that they've provided to us. So you all are amongst our hopeful uh, users of the guiding framework. So if you have a chance in the course of the next few days to take a look at it, I would welcome any feedback that you have um, that you'd be willing to provide. So just to give you a sense of um, how we included and excluded indicators in the guiding framework. We started from a similar pool that the FSIN work began with, um, which was just a broad canvassing of all um, food security indicators that were out there. We decided, though, that we, we needed, we wanted indicators that captured one or more of the key food security components 
and um, had to be measured at one of the levels that Will just spoke about. We also were looking for indicators that were ideally in active use and that had been tested or validated in one or more countries and or promoted by large international organizations. Um, if, you know, there were some cases where indicators actually haven't been validated, nor are they being promoted by international organizations, but we thought that some of those indicators, there were some indicators that were still valuable and thus included them um, in the guiding framework. So there was a little bit of, you know, subjective, uh, a subjective element there. And then in terms of exclusion, so any indicators that um, were measuring causes or consequences of food insecurity that were more kind of distally related to the definition, we excluded, as well as any program implementation related indicators. So if you're looking for these things, you won't find them in the guiding framework. Just uh, be forewarned. So the overall focus, as I said, is on dietary related food security indicators. So this is just a screenshot. It's sort of, it doesn't give you any specific information, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what you would find if you, when you do go to the guiding framework, if you click through it. Um, this is uh, for the MDDW, the Minimum Dietary Diversity Score for Women. Um, and so you'll find on this page a description, an overview of the indicator, how to construct the indicator, um, what types of uses, I mean, the page goes on and on, and there are hyperlinks throughout, as well as um, these are all hyperlinked on the side that will take you to other potentially useful resources for how to use that indicator. Um, so we're back to the definition here, and I just wanted to highlight this again um, for the purposes of this discussion, because as you can see, we, the index project, we're focusing specifically on dietary intake, but I think it's worth pointing out that um, you know, in, in the definition, as well noted, there is this element of sufficiency, safety, nutritious, so nutrient adequacy, um, all for an active and healthy life. However, despite what we've seen since the 1970s with this shift of definition and shift of focus in terms of um, you know, expanding our understanding of what food security is from pure availability more towards access, what we know is that we still have limited um, food security indicators that squarely collect information on, for example, cultural preferences of food or even food safety. So there's still a lot of emphasis on caloric sufficiency when it comes to indicators and increasingly on diet quality. So because of this, we came up with yet another sort of uh, framework, if you will. <laughs> so <laughs> if your heads are spinning, I apologize. But following on the nice description that Will gave, we thought that leaving it at the level, which we have here, so it actually goes from the bottom up where we have national market, market household and household and individual, we thought that leaving it at the level wasn't sufficient and that actually users are going to want to think about food security and, and diet related food security indicators in terms of the specific dimensions. So what you see cross tabulated along the top are um, basically caloric sufficiency, which would be the quantity, nutrient adequacy, which is quality, food safety, cultural preference, um, stability, and then sustainability of the food system in general. And we have the guiding framework organized in this way, and it's actually quite telling because what you can see is that, you know, under these, so for national and market level indicators, under quantity, there are quite a few. Same with um, individual and household level quantity related indicators, there are quite a few. At this point, also under quality, there are quite a few. But when you come to this part of the framework, there remain big holes in indicators. So if you're interested in metrics and want to get into developing indicators, I think it's useful to start thinking about some of these spaces that exist. And we're still, again, this is the beta version, so we're still in the process of um, expanding the set of indicators that are in there. So if you have suggestions or see specific things that are missing, we would definitely welcome your feedback. Um, so again, the, the index project itself has a stronger focus on the household and individual level because we're really interested in collecting 24-hour dietary recall data. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Will. Here's the categories that we use in the user's guide that we'd like to separate out the group into uh, areas of interest, right? So you would hold up the number for the table you want to be at to talk about these indicators, the number that corresponds to the classification I'm about to share. So the first category that we'll talk about 
Um, so if you want to talk about national data, you'd you know, hold up number one. Um, and my prediction is there's relatively few of you who will want to do this because this is something that's principally for national planning uh, agencies, um, central office staff in the Ministry of Agriculture, or um, country representatives in Rome, for example. They're the people who are most interested in this. So there are five major indicators that I'll share with you, and it's possible that no table will want to talk about these. That's fine. The second kind is market data, which are principally prices. Um, there's three of them uh, that we'll, I'll, I'll share with you in a minute that, that are in the user's guide, and, and many more that might be uh, potentially considered. And some of you might want to form a table around market prices and market data. There's my prediction is that most tables will want to discuss this. So the category of household and individual recall data are the indicators that get done in a household survey where an enumerator comes and in a course of half an hour or up to two hours just gets some quick recall from the family about things. This is by far the most common kind of data. It's by far the most useful. In pro I expect that most tables uh, you know, are likely to, to want to work on this. People also, of course, do heights and weights, anthropometry, uh, can include not just heights, weights, but also circumferences. For underdevelopment, very low income settings, people are very interested in uh, head circumference. And then for um, over nutrition or over consumption, people are extremely interested in waist to, uh, circumference, which is very closely correlated with cardiovascular risk and other things. So heights, weights, and circumferences. Um, there's a composite measure called prevalence of undernourishment, which is extremely important for the FAO. So we'll talk about that briefly. And there might be a table that wants to discuss that. Um, there might be a table or two that want to discuss biomarkers and clinical data. So Shibani will speak to anthropometry and the biomarkers um, from a, you know, a medical perspective. And there might be some tables that want to uh, address that. Um, tremendous amount of interest in dimensions of nutrition that are not diets at all. So in particular, these two. And there is a certain amount of interest in composite and multidimensional uh, measures, which add up different indicators in various ways. So we'll ask you to hold up a number at your, you know, for your table. I mean, not everyone has to hold it up, but just go to someone who has the number you're interested in, whether you care about one or another of these you know, more than the others, and that can be the one that you focus on. Then we'll ask you to discuss the, in terms of the questions that I posed at the beginning and share back uh, what, you, what you think about best practices, pitfalls, and guidance for programs and policies in this domain, okay? Whatever kind of... In, uh, so what I want to do is quickly, uh, before lunch, and then we'll reconvene after lunch and finish out all the indicators, to describe what are these four of this, three of that, and so forth, that the user's guide documents, and what other kinds of indicators you might, you might care about. So first, on the country-level one. Now, the user's guide, as its criterion, remember, had those principles that, that we discussed. Those principles led to the selection of these um, indicators at the country level and each other type uh, of the one through eight categories. Um, based on indicators for which there was enough data that many people are using that kind of metric. The first and most important number one metric in the user's guide, not because it's most important for a particular program or project, but it's because it's the oldest, most widely used, most established, and in some senses also very, very, still very important in, in the world, um, is dietary energy in total kilocalories per capita. Right? So this is something that is known at the national level. You don't know which person is eating what, but it's known from the national food balance sheets. There's also each dimension of the diet quality of the national food supply from food balance sheets, meaning how much dal per capita, how much tomato per capita, how much total vitamin A per capita is available because you add up all the sources of vitamin A. We know that from the food balance sheets. We know total vitamin A in a country from the food balance sheets. It's a total national number. You don't know who gets it, but you know what the total is. You also know the diversity of the food supply. And this is, a lot of people are very interested in this. So a Shannon type index is capturing the degree to which the food supply is spread out over many species. 
It's from the ecology literature, where if you're a country like Bangladesh, where a very large fraction of your calories come from just one species, rice, that's different from a country like Uganda, where your calories come from many different species, because there's many different starchy staples and also a lot of calories from non-starchy staples. And then the fourth national data is variability of these over time. So you can measure variability through standard deviations or coefficients of variation as they vary around a trend uh, over time. So you can see that these, um, oh, oh sorry, then there was one more that people said, wait, wait, we, we have to count this as a national datum of great interest, and that's public expenditure. So for the Maputo Declaration of the CADEP, for African governments and for other targets, people agree to spend a certain amount of their government budget on agriculture, nutrition, and so forth, and that would be tracked in this way. So if you want to talk about these kinds of measures, you would hold up number one, form that group, okay? These indicators, remember, they're things that exist at the national level. They're of great interest to your country representative in Rome and so forth, um, uh, or in, in UN in New York. That's what they are concerned with. For the market level data, the indicators that were of widest use and most interest to stakeholders of the FSIN are, first of all, the relative price of food compared to everything else. And that's the idea that if food is getting cheaper than everything else, agriculture is improving faster than every other sector. Right? And so it's, people are able to acquire food. They may not be able to buy a car, they may not be able to buy a house, but they can buy food. But if food is getting relatively more expensive compared to other things, then agriculture is falling behind. Right? So this was the first um, relative price. And then compare food prices to wages, which is what we call affordability. Are people able to buy food? Remember, this is a different dimension. You can see how these two dimensions are related, the price of food compared to the price of uh, housing or the price of health care, and then the price of food compared to wages, and then volatility of food prices over time. Okay? So those are market-level data that, that would be of, of, of interest. Um, you don't know who benefits or, or gains from food. Right? You don't know who buys or sells, but food prices are um, you know, often quite interesting. Surveys, as I mentioned, is the most commonly used category. So I expect that this category, which would be number three, right? if you want to talk about survey data for your program or policy, analysis program, uh, policy analysis uh, kind of activity, your, your monitoring and evaluation sort of work, you would do something that uses a recall uh, survey where you might ask in the most common, the oldest, the um, uh, in some ways still very, very useful metric of food insecurity, is just how much of your total budget do you have to devote to food? Okay. So as you probably know, the poorest people in the world spend about 80% of their income on food. They don't go to 100%, because if you tried to go to 100% spending on food, you would never, ever be able to have any health care at all. You would never be able to have any um, uh, transportation at all, because 100% would be on food. So you wouldn't survive, actually. We don't observe people spending 100% of their money on food. But we do observe people who are so poor that they spend 80% of their money on food. And when you spend 80% of your money on food, you are surely malnourished, you are surely food insecure, simply by the virtue of that fact. Because you have, to, uh, you have so little room to have any improvement, you're buying the cheapest possible food, the least expensive possible food. And if there's any bad thing happens to you, you can't afford because you're already at the margin of subsistence. So someone who's at 80% spending on food is in very bad shape nutritionally and food security. That number is sufficient to tell you that. If somebody is down to 10% of their income spent on food, they have a lot of room to maneuver to improve their diet quality, to make sure they have stable access to food and so forth. So this is still the single most important, most useful measure at the household level, is what fraction of your budget do you have to spend on food? 
tells you how well you're able to improve your quality, meet your needs, and so forth. It's a stunning fact that this very simple measure is so powerful, but it, but it is. Second most widely used and interesting measure is diversity. Diet diversity is a surprisingly useful measure if you group foods accordingly, correct, you know, usefully in, in categories. And there's, of course, many different categorizations of food groups, but when you categorize foods into groups that merge like with like, and you say, did you get some of this, and also some of this, and also some of this, and if you also got a fourth and a fifth group, then you know you must have had a sufficient mix of attributes if you mixed like with like in each food group to say starchy staples, uh, leguminous grains, vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables, green leafy fruits and vegetables, other fruits, other vegetables, and so forth. If you know that you got five of those groups, you must, you are very likely to have gotten a sufficiently diverse diet because people don't move on to additional groups until they've had enough of the earlier group. We're exploiting behavior to just simply count groups and obtain a pretty useful measure of diet quality. Of course, it's not perfect. That's why there's many more indicators to come. Um, you might also try to get a measure of quantity consumed. Right, diet diversity is just did you consume. When you ask about quantity consumed, we could begin with total dietary energy, but then go on to which nutrients and which food components did you consume enough of. So diet quality indexes could be expressed as a ratio, what fraction of your total calories was not starchy staples. It could be expressed as a level, what is the quantity of vitamin A you had, and it could be expressed as a percentage of a requirement, what fraction of your population's estimated average requirement of vitamin A did you have as, your, as, as intake, and so forth. That's all grouped into, um, into, into one kind of measure in the FSIN user's guide. Uh, and when you compare them to age or sex-specific requirements, that gives you a metric of, of adequacy. So those dietary um, metrics are all based on what you actually consume. But there's a very important category of recall data, which is, did you experience a kind of hardship that we call food insecurity? Meaning, did you have to skip a meal? Did you have to uh, uh, worry about whether you would, where, how you would get food, and so forth? So those food um, insecurity experience scale questions are indicative of hardship and stress that's associated with a lot of maladies. So even if I make it up later by diet quality, so my diet, uh, total dietary intake over the course of a year might be adequate. If I've experienced hardship for a period of weeks or months, um, that's bad for, for health. So those experience-based scales are very helpful as a separate kind of measure beyond dietary intake. Um, and finally, coping strategies indexes ask what else about your life did you disrupt in order to meet food needs, right? So coping strategies indexes asked you, did you have to sell assets? Did you have to sell your livestock? Did you have to, so it's what else in your life was, dis, was uh, given up in order to meet food needs. So I hope you can see that these are all survey questions that I ask you with a questionnaire. I sit down under a tree outside your house and I ask you these things. That's what these measures are. The whole point of the user's guide is that every one of these things is caused by many things and has many consequences. We're just asking, can we describe what it is that was measured? And talk about that as a group. So anybody who wants to talk about this kind of survey question, um, you would hold up, this is number three, right? Number three. So you'd hold up number three. And my prediction is, this is probably most of you, because this is a very big basket. Right? It's a very big basket. Uh, and these are all at the level of family, right, household level data because of its recall nature. Okay. And then um, Shivani's going to talk about more medical biological things, which I know nothing about. I don't do guiding frameworks. 
I love the fact that they're there because then I can actually guide myself with their frameworks. But the key thing that I always think about as a researcher is the data. Where is this data coming from for these indicators that we are talking about? And I think that's one of the key things when you're trying to design your own indicators or your own dashboard is the source of your data and the quality of your data. Because that's, if you're using existing data, which is whether they're national surveys or they are existing survey data sets that you have uh, received from some other source, you need to look at what the quality of that data is. I think that was one of the points that I sort of wanted to add in um, to this indicator discussion. Because we could spend a lot of time talking about how to compute them, but if the quality of the data is not at the level that you would want it to be, your computations would not be of much relevance. So that's one thing, the first point I wanted to make. The second point is, I'm of course talking about anthropometry, and I'm just wondering how many of you, you can do a show of hands, have actually um, conducted anthropometry in the field? You just put your hands up. Okay, this is a sizable. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. So we're not going to go through all the ind individual definitions. So essentially, we all know that what anthropometry is, is essentially a um, set of measurements to understand what the um, human body's physical appearance is. And as Will has already mentioned, there's different types of measurements. Usually the most common ones are height, weights, and then we do different types of circumferences. So everybody is familiar with the height for age? Anyone, any show of hands of anyone who doesn't know what height for age is? Yeah, so we, we all use prevalence of stunting is a very, very common indicator that is used um, in nutrition and it's used um, in trying to understand agriculture to nutrition linkages. Um, it's also, as Will has mentioned, it's one of the key indicators of many uh, bilateral donors such as USAID. And um, it's also one of the key targets for the World Health Assembly because, anybody know why stunting is such an important target? Any idea? Yes. Yeah, it's chronic malnutrition. Yeah, sorry, can someone pass the mic? But wh why is chronic malnutrition such an important indicator? Like, why are we considering stunting as such an important indicator? Because weight will be the, you know, the short instance of looking into the nutrition, but height will be the thorough look inside to uh, see the chronic malnutrition. Because uh, you might lose weight for short term uh, malnutrition, but to lose height, you need chronic malnutrition, basically. Okay. Fair enough, it's a longer term process. The other thing to think about is the fact that it's one of the, it's, it's the highest prevalence. There are about 34 countries in the world which have very, very high rates of um, stunting, and India and Nepal, where we are all from here, ma many of us here, uh, rates are about 50% and more, and I think all of you uh, who are here from Nepal or from India, I think one of the things we've been trying to figure out is what's going on and what do we do to address this issue. Um, and I'm getting, like, it's four minutes to lunch, so I'm going to move on. Uh, but one of the things that I want to sort of point out to the fact is that uh, stunting is one of the most important indicators that we all are looking at. And so then the question is, how do you measure it? And the measurements are done by just a simple height measurement. Um, but you should know that heights are not measured routinely in any survey, unless you do a DHS survey, which happens every five years. So you as a researcher could include height for age in your own survey or in your own studies. But if you want to look for existing data on heights, let's say you're uh, working with health services and you want to find out if they've collected height data. Not a single health service in any country, in any of these high burden countries or any of the others actually collect heights. So that's a big challenge. You're not going to find the data that you need. You have to collect your own data. And the other thing is it's very simple to say that it's height, but height measurements can be very difficult. And there is a lot of variability. So the two of you could, we, let's say we have this table and we have all six of you measuring the same person, you might actually have a lot of variability between all six of you. And those cause errors that actually are going to cause errors with your computations. And this exists across the board for any anthropometric measurement that you can uh, you think about. So I'm just sort of focusing on height for age, but you have the same issues for weight for age. More, more likely to find the data for weight for age because of the fact that it's clinically available. Um, but you see, see, still have the same problem. Now, 
Everybody familiar with MUAC? Yeah? Okay, so not, not very much to go into other than the fact that it's actually a very quick, um, quick and dirty measure uh, where you can measure the made-up arm circumference and determine um, whether the person or the individual or the child, particularly a child, is suffering from severe acute malnutrition. Um, we also use weight for age. It's one of the most underutilized indicators. We've kind of shifted away from underweight because we say it's a composite of stunting and wasting. Ergo, we don't actually use it, but it's actually a very important indicator. Um, and then we've kind of touched a little bit on this. In the guide, we do have this discussion about BMI uh, and body mass index. And from the pre underweight prevalence perspective in reproductive age women, but also the fact that many of the countries that we are working in, now you have overweight prevalences increasing. So for instance, we work in Uganda, in the southwest of Uganda, and what we are seeing in the to be, we did three rounds of data collection in about um, 3,000 households, and what we find is the prevalence of overweight is much higher in the women in these households than underweight. And, and the prevalence of underweight is actually a key indicator for the world health targets. So that's something to think about in terms of how you're choosing your indicators and what's happening at the, uh, at the uh, population level. And uh, Will has mentioned waist circumference, and this is a very common indicator that's used across many, many countries to determine your risk, your metabolic risk for cardiovascular disease.